Hola a todos, buenos días, bienvenidos al cuarto día del Congreso Latinoamericano de Aracnología. Estamos eh, aquí en la Universidad del Rosario y el día de hoy tenemos el gusto de presentar a nuestro conferencista magistral, el doctor Danilo Harms. So I'm going to introduce Danilo. So, Dr. Danilo Harms works at the Leibniz Institute for the Analysis of the Biodi of Biodiversity Change in Hamburg, Germany. He specializes in arachnology and paleontology with a particular focus on the taxonomy, systematics, and evolution of spiders and pseudoscorpions. Harms has conducted extensive fieldwork across various regions, contributing to the understanding of pseudoscorpion diversity and distribution. His research integrates morphological and molecular data to el elucidate evolutionary relationships and species identification. In paleontology, Harms explores the fossil record to understand the historical biodiversity and evolutionary history of arachnids, enhancing the global knowledge of both recent and ancient arachnid biodiversity. Danilo also enjoys coffee and conducted fieldwork in the tropical forests. Welcome, Danilo. Catalina, you make it sound very good. <laughs> Coffee and fieldwork in combination is great. I see that all the young people are fading out, so the parties must be good, which is, ah, you didn't go to the party? Or you went, I see? Okay. Anyway, so let's talk about pseudoscorpions. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. It's my first time at a Latin American Congress, and it's also my first time in Colombia, and it's immensely enjoyable to meet you all, and also to have, if that's working, if it's not working, it doesn't do anything right now. Ah, now, so, that's what I do. Since I arrived, I enjoy Colombian coffee, right? So I have a serious coffee addiction, And I'm known to be a German who likes coffee a lot. But generally, Germans are known to be uh, liking other things. And that is beer. Copious amounts of beer. And I know that you guys like your cerveza too. Uh, so, and if we go down 
what Germans like even more and what we're known for, it's like big machinery, cars. Here, I'm not trying to make advertise Mercedes, but you know, we like big cars, we like the autobahn where you can drive as fast as you want. 200 Ks an hour is not a problem at all. But what Germans should actually also be popular for is their love for gardening. And it looks like this. So Germany is quite a cold country and winter is horrible. So in spring, everyone's getting out into their gardens and they start putting plants in the ground and they start feeling really, really happy and reading newspapers and doing like whatever people are doing. But this is kind of our lead into the galaxy of pseudoscorpions because in every garden, you do find a compost heap. Right, and you would maybe know this. So this is where you basically uh, put your organic rubbish, so leaves and de decomposing matter, which is then broken down, and you have fresh new soil each year to fertilize your plants. So, and one thing uh, that is really interesting is to look into the fauna of compost heaps, and that's something I sometimes do with university students because it's the most amazing fauna. So. Compost heaps, they, they, they are full of life. Arthropods, other invertebrates, earthworms, all kinds of small creepy crawlers you can ever imagine. And if you are lucky um, and you search well enough, you will also find these guys. Yeah? Small animals, maybe one or two millimeters long, eating other animals in the compost heap. And this is uh, our pseudoscorpions. So, because they're so small, they don't really look like much, but if you start magnifying them, you have a lens or you put them under the microscope, they're really beautiful animals, right? So a bit looking like scorpions, but lacking the tail and the sting. So once we enter the galaxy of pseudoscorpions, we enter a galaxy which is very unlike that of spiders or that of scorpions. First of all, what I find fascinating about, about pseudoscorpions is that this is a very old arachnid lineage that is significantly older than, say, spiders and has had a lot of time to evolve very complex ecological behavioral traits. We find it all from, on the left, you see communal hunting strategies, from cooperative breeding strategies, sexual dimorphism, a complex breeding ecology, and of course, their signature trait, which is forazy on other uh, animals, including many insects. So there's a lot to discover. And I'm trying to uh, basically showcase some of these aspects in just under 50 minutes. One problem we have with pseudoscorpions is size. So here's a little game for you just to wake you up. On this slide, you see a wonderful Magellamorph spider which all you would all know because you're from South America. But on this slide, I've also hidden a pseudoscorpion. Can anyone see the pseudoscorpion? Point to it, point to it, we wake you up. Okay. There it comes. Yep, that's the pseudoscorpion. So just saying, pseudoscorpions are everywhere. They're in all habitats, all terrestrial habitats, other than Antarctica, you find them where you search for them. So leaf, leaf litter, tree bark, even in your house you can have them, but they're small. So you need different techniques and a different approach to find them and uh, then also to study them and that's one of the obstacles. But uh, in my talk I want to like basically highlight three galaxies of pseudoscorpions, uh, pseudoscorpion research that are not entirely linked uh, but uh, should be. Of course I will talk about uh, morphology, systematics, evolution, and biogeography. Very quickly, this is uh, something I do in my lab with my students and postdocs. Uh, we do a lot of research in this direction. Uh, but then I will also talk about behavior and uh, reproduction and ecology, because I know that many of you are interested in these aspects, and pseudoscorpions have a lot to offer. And I will use one South American species, um, mostly for this, Paratymnoides nidificator, just to showcase what one can do with just one model species. And then, uh, in the third uh, section of the talk, maybe five or six minutes, I'm going to talk about applied research directions, because usually people would think, well, or I'm often asked, why do you study pseudoscorpions? 
you know, and then you have to come up with an answer. And uh, my answer would be that because we're really cool and we're from the Devonian and stuff, but that doesn't really convince some grant agencies. Uh, but there's some other things you can do to make them really appealing, and there's a lot of research, research going in that direction too. Um, Califer Cancoides is a new model system for applied research, and I'm going to talk about that briefly. So, what are pseudoscorpions? Like basically, the small sisters and brothers of scorpions. It's a very poorly studied arachnid lineage. Uh, the other only, uh, the only other arachnid lineage I think that is so poorly studied is the solifuges. Um, and we know currently 25 families, roughly 4,400 species, which is significantly less than spiders. But bear in mind that there are very few pseudoscorpion researchers. And I'm going to show you some slides later on, basically um, alluding to the fact that pseudoscorpions are possibly just as diverse as spiders. And they have unique properties. Uh, pseudoscorpions also have the ability to produce silk. But they do not uh, produce silk from spinnerets and spigots on the spinnerets. They use a specific uh, structure on the chalicera, which you can see on the upper right. It's here. The so-called galia. So basically, they, um, they spin or they produce silk with their jaws. And they use this silk to, uh, to make these chambers hibernation chambers, breeding chambers, uh, and they can produce various kinds of silk also with the galia. Most pseudoscorpions, not all pseudoscorpions, um, also produce venom, um, but they don't do that like scorpions. They don't produce it in the telson. They have specific glands on, in their kila, so the pedipalp hands, uh, which you can see here, and they use that to envenomate their prey. So very cool animals, very unique in many ways. And in terms of classification, I don't want to bore you uh, in the morning with too many classification issues. I just want to highlight you or just want to show you the most recent phylogeny for pseudoscorpions, which is not something I have done, but Liria has, has done that uh, with Gonzalo Jiribet and Julia, who is also here today, um, and Mark Harvey. This is quite a good phylogeny because it's based on 1,700 transcriptomes. It's fairly robust. Um, and we have in this phylogeny, um, or this phylogeny, uh, three suborders of pseudoscorpions. Um, the two basal ones is the Hedrospheronida and the Atroposphironida. These are pseudoscorpions without venom glands. So venom glands are not an apomorphic trait for pseudoscorpions. The most basic pseudoscorpions don't have them. Whereas we see so no venom glands here. Coming in now? Ah, here. But what we see is here in the Eukaryota, the largest suborder, um, venom glands are present. They are being evolved. And they um, seem to be very important for pseudoscorpions because we can see just in the diversity of Eukaryota in terms of families how diverse this group is. Yeah, so very important in evolution, evolutionary terms. This phylogeny is not going to be the end of pseudoscorpion classification. We know many families are polyphyletic or paraphyletic, but uh, that is always on classification, right? So. Let me explain or highlight you the three suborders of pseudoscorpions. The most basic pseudoscorpions, and those I really like to work on, is the Heterus furonida. And these guys are special because they have um, a different segmentation, or um, they, the, the, the third and the fourth pair of legs has a different segmentation than the first two pairs of legs. That means in the first pairs of legs, the tarsus and the metatarsus are fused, so there effectively is only a tarsus, whereas in the third and the fourth pair of legs, there is a metatarsus and the tarsus. So why this is so, uh, why in these animals the tarsus and the metatarsus has been fused in the first pair of, uh, pairs of legs is not known. But we know that these animals are very basal pseudoscorpions. We do find them in leaf litter, in uh, soil, and in caves. Um, there's one superfamily, uh, the Ketonioidea here, and uh, the name is derived from the Greek god Ketonius, that was the god of the underworld in Greek mythology. So the, the bad guys uh, that are curating the dead 
Um, and the pseudoscorpions are really cool in the sense that uh, they have no venom glands, but they have massive chelicerae because they use mechanical force to kill their prey. There are also some um, plesiomorphic features in these pseudoscorpions. Some of these retain a small uh, cub a tubercle between the third and the fourth leg coxa, the intercoxal tubercle, which has been interpreted as a relic of the sternum, which is then lost in higher pseudoscorpions, but most other uh, arachnids do have a sternum. So this is how these animals look like. It's coming up now. Beautiful. We call them dragon pseudoscorpions in my lab because they just look like small, archaic dragons. Massive chelicerae, so you don't want to be a small springtail. Uh, you're going to be mashed up, you're going to be eaten, and these animals don't need venom. They don't have venom, they just uh, do it with mecha mechanical force. This is a, a troglobitic species from Tasmania, and it's actually quite big, but beautiful. The second suborder in the pseudoscorpions, which is also very basal, but looks entirely different, is the Atoposphyronida. These are pseudoscorpions with horns on their carapace, and these animals are very, very rare. There are only 50 described species. They turn up every now and then, randomly in biodiversity surveys. There's only one species from South America, from the Atlantic forest in Brazil, and then these animals are found again in uh, parts of Africa and Australia. So these are really cool. We call them uh, Hercules pseudoscorpions because uh, they're just really flat animals, but sometimes the pedipalps here are really thickened, very powerful. They're strongly sclerotized to a degree that even the anus is sclerotized. So I actually don't know how these animals poop, but they do that. Otherwise, they wouldn't be alive. And uh, every, everything is sclerotized here. Even um, uh, the, the platelets of the tergites, sternites, and the pleura is uh, sclerotized. And then, of course, we have the eukarata. So these pseudoscorpions that do have venom glands. And the evolution of venom glands uh, probably occurred in the stem species of all of, the, of this massive radiation. Um, and probably the venom glands have been evolved in both kilofingers, first and foremost, and have then been lost in some of the families independently again. So you can find families of pseudoscorpions that have venom glands in both fingers or only in one of the kilofingers, uh, and that's important for family classification. Now, I don't want to bore you and go through all these families. Uh, you can come to my lab, and I'm going to give you like an eight-day crash course on pseudoscorpion taxonomy and morphology, and you're going to be an expert. We just want to highlight these are pseudoscorpions with venom glands, um, and these are is the bulk of a described diversity, so 2,500 described species. This is also where the ecological and uh, behavioral complexity comes in. So the heterospheronida and the atoposphyronida, they live in leaf litter, they live in soil, uh, they don't really do much, they're not dis dispersal prone. These guys here, they live, often live in ephemeral habitats, such as tree bark, animal nests. Many species are symbiotic or common cells of you know, mammal nests and bird nests and so forth. Uh, they also have you know, complex breeding strategies and all that kind of thing. So we're going to focus uh, on these groups um, in the second part of the talk. Just to highlight some of the families, here's the Etemnidae and the Canatidae. And these are the pseudoscorpions that are highly phoretic. So if there's a trend in these two families to hitchhike on insects or other vectors or even on arachnids, spiders, for example, or harvestmen, to get from place E to place, uh, a place A to place B. Um, and also we have things like this here. So we have these animals basically hunting in a, as a pack of lions, bringing down larger prey, subduing that prey through envenomation. Um, and as division of labor in colonies, for example. Another family that is really cool is the Califaridae, these guys here, uh, which have very complex breeding ecologies because the males have these, you see that on the uh, upper right, these rams organs, these massive yeah, organs uh, that the males pull out during courtship to lure the female in. The internal genitalia that we see in the center here in the middle are also highly complex, and these animals have evolved 
very complex mating ecologies, uh, behaviors, and so forth. And um, they are now increasingly being studied for their sexual behavior and ecology, which I think is, is great. Um, one thing what I really like about pseudoscorpions is that they're just really, really old. So this is um, um, from a paper that my friend Jason Dunlop has written some years ago, a decade ago, on the fossil history of the arachnid orders. And here are the arachnid orders, including the extinct ones, and this is the timeline from the upper. So the upper line is basically now, and the base is uh, the Silurian. And what we do see is that pseudoscorpions come in very early in arachnid evolution. So this little squashed piece of cuticle that doesn't look like anything is the earliest pseudoscorpion fossil, Dracochila diprohendo from the upper Devonian. It's 400 million years old, and it doesn't look like much, but if you examine it, and pseudoscorpion researchers have done it, you do find that it basically is a modern pseudoscorpion. So if that thing was crawling around in the forest today, and I'd have to have it in my sifting tray, I'd say, yeah, cool. Yeah? So that shows us that pseudoscorpions are probably even older than that. And just by comparison, the green dot here is the spiders. Yeah, they can't come in uh, uh, significantly later in the fossil record. So if we look at pseudoscorpions, we can uh, investigate evolutionary patterns, evolutionary processes for long periods of time. And this is something what I really like to do. One thing, there are two things with pseudoscorpions in general, once we want to look at the evolution of this order. The first thing is the poor fossil record. Apart from Dracochila de Prohenda from the Devonian, there are almost no pseudoscorpion fossils. They do kick uh, in again uh, in amber deposits across the world. So there's Burmese amber from the Cretaceous, one, roughly 100 million years old. And then these animals are really diverse in, uh, in Baltic amber and Bitterfeld amber in Europe, which is 40 million years old. That's for one problem. Uh, the second, so poor fossil record. And the second thing is also it's been very difficult to place pseudoscorpions in the phylogeny of the arachnids because they're just a very long old branch. But two years ago, or three years ago, uh, Prashant Sharma and his people have written a very nice paper basically looking at, uh, at big transcriptomic data, I think it was, and long branch attraction, and placing the pseudoscorpions now with scorpions. So these two lineages are sisters, which I personally quite like as an hypothesis. But anyway, going back to the fossil record, in order to improve this, and I've summarized the fossil record some years ago with Jason, and uh, we found, or we said, well, there are only very few fossils, and they don't tell us anything about the evolutionary processes, so we need to look at that in more detail. So I came up with a project uh, to look at pseudoscorpion fossils in more detail. And what we do now is that we source pseudoscorpion fossils from amber deposits across the world. This, for example, is Baltic amber from the, uh, of the Baltic Sea, uh, where I live now in Hamburg. And we screen these amber pieces for pseudoscorpions. And uh, on the upper left, you see a pseudoscorpion. You might not actually see the pseudoscorpion because it's in an amber piece. And the pseudoscorpion here in the middle is kind of sitting on an insect. Uh, you can't see the ventral side at all. You can't really, uh, there's also all kinds of artifacts with that fossil. And that's a general problem. So we teamed up with a German Syncroton Center, which uh, fortunately is in Hamburg. And we apply for beam time there. And what we do now is that we go there twice a year and we scan amber pieces uh, using synchrotron radiation. So how does it work? This is uh, high-tech technology in a sense that you basically have photons that are being chased through uh, um, a long beam that is running under Hamburg for several kilometers. And in a magnetic field, uh, these photons are enriched in energy and then they're being shot through a piece of amber, and then we'd get very, very good data, and we can generate models from this data. It's quite a laborious process, and it's high tech, so way too much for my poor biological brain to comprehend all this, how it works, but I don't need to understand this, because what I need to understand is that I have amber pieces, and I glue them on a stub, or well, actually it's the students doing that most of the time, not here, and here we have the photons coming out of this beam. And this is our amber piece, if it comes up. 
here and it's being rotated in the process. Um, and it, uh, basically it's being shot uh, yeah, for half an hour, treated half, for half an hour with photons. And what we do get after, after this process and after well, several days of reconstructing the, the original data, which are uh, well, quite dense, we get um, three-dimensional model. Yeah, this is a small pseudoscorpion, roughly one millimeter long. It's not well preserved uh, at all. It's from the Cretaceous, 100 million years uh, old. And it's also been wrapped in spider silk. But we can use these uh, three-dimensional models now to interpret these fossils. And this is what I do with my students. And you get the, the beautiful, the most beautiful models. So this is a pseudoscorpion, for example, that is uh, only two millimeters long. That's the one I was showing two slides earlier. And you can now see the ventral side. You can even see all the CTA and so forth. And you can actually really place that uh, fossil in uh, systematically. But also you, you can investigate the biogeography and the evolutionary history of these fossils. And we're doing that now for some years. And uh, we have many students doing that. And the students really quite like this. So in the phylogeny of pseudoscorpions, it's just a different representation of this phylogeny. We are well, pumping out two, three, four papers each year, basically um, uh, describing or improving the fossil record of pseudoscorpions. So all these purple stars are, you know, fossils we have described and interpreted by geographically next to old ones, which are these uh, black ones. Um, but you do see that there's still a major gap in the fossil record of pseudoscorpions. Um, and what we also do see is that uh, the amber fossils very much look like recent fauna, although they are sometimes 100 million years old, which is very different from spiders, where usually you see lots of differences between uh, amber fossils and those today. So what we can say is that pseudoscorpions probably diversified into the families we find today, but sometimes even the genera we find today long before the Cretaceous. Sometimes it's like really strange. Stephanie Lauria, for example, she was giving a talk yesterday. There are some fossils that basically look in, are indistinguishable from modern species. That is quite something. So we have stasis, uh, morphological stasis over long periods of time, also ecological stasis. So to go on out to the molecular level, so going out of paleontology, uh, one family which I focused on in my PhD and I still tend to work on is the most basal pseudoscorpion family, the Pseudotyrannicophonidae. Uh, these are pseudoscorpions that are really cool in a sense that they're great models like the Cyphoptami harvest meant for biogeography because they're just really old. And they are found in music forest systems and in caves in very disjunct distributions. They do occur in South America in the Valdivian forest and in the Magalans in Chile. They're found in Madagascar and South Africa. They're also found in um, Australia. And then they have a bipolar distribution in North America, but also in Eastern Asia. And there are some fossils in Europe basically highlighting that these animals were more widespread in the past. And so seeing this pattern, the job of my PhD was uh, to test a, a, a basically a model of Pangean uh, biogeography. So the idea was that these animals lived on Pangaea before it broke up, and the current uh, classification and the current molecular phylogeny should mirror uh, this breakup uh, scenario. So that's been a long work in process, but I've been sampling various continents and it, it's been quite complicated to do it. But uh, some weeks ago, Stephanie Lauria and I were able to publish the first family uh, phylogeny for pseudoscorpions ever and uh, also place this family in a biogeographical framework. By the way, Stephanie is here today. She's starting her own lab in Oklahoma soon, and she's a scorpion and pseudoscorpion lady. So if you want to work with her, talk to her. And now she's embarrassed. <laughs> Importantly, this dated phylogeny, uh, in this dated phylogeny, we do see some patterns that are really reflective and indicative of continental drift. Here's a clade, for example, which uh, you see in purple. They are all the species from Madagascar, Sri Lanka, and Southern Africa grouped together. And this is a uh, diversification with Cretaceous, kind of coinciding with uh, the rift of Madagascar, South Africa, and from, uh, sorry, Madagascar and India from Africa in the Cretaceous. And we also see some other things that work really well here. 
is a clade Australia and Chile are grouping together, so South America could group, be grouping together, which you would also expect under continental vicarians. But sometimes with these very old lineages, you can be surprised. And I just want to focus more on the southern clade here, so uh, the South American and the Australian fauna. So I'm going to highlight this part of the tree in the next slide. If it comes up, yeah, here you go. And on the upper, uh, on the upper left, we see the Australian taxa, and then uh, these are in, in pink, and in olive, we have the Chilean taxa. And some years ago, I was out hunting these pseudoscorpions in caves in Tasmania. So Tasmania is the small island to the south coast of Australia. We were out chasing these pseudoscorpions in caves, and we incorporated them into the molecular phylogeny. And one cool thing is here that there are some species from Tasmania, from caves, that rather than nesting with the Australian fauna and the phylogeny, actually nest as the outgroup of a Chilean species. So how do we explain this? These are animals that live in caves. Where this is a species, for example, uh, that is known only from two specimens from a single cave. Um, they don't fly. Yeah, they don't disperse, they don't do anything really. And it's a very, very old uh, clade here, 94 million years old in the Cretaceous. And by the way, the split between Antarctica is uh, a lot younger. So somewhere 35 million years ago. So the only explanation is that these are really, really ancient relic lineages. So this pseudoscorpion here is the remnant of a lineage that persists in Tasmanian caves was probably more widespread in southern Gondwana, including Antarctica, before Antarctica froze. And it's now a remnant that's stuck in a cave somewhere and has an, um, well, an evolutionary history that goes back to the Cretaceous. So really, really cool stuff that gets me really excited. And that is something that only these very old lineages can provide. Yeah. We don't want to move here. We do see that continental drift is very important uh, as a driver for diversification in this leaf litter and soy dwelling uh, uh, scorpions. Here's work uh, that my former PhD student Jeetan Johnson has done on two very common pseudoscorpion genera, Leganicophonius and Tyrannicophonius. These are probably the most diverse pseudoscorpion genera. You find them everywhere in the tropics, including Colombia. If you go here into a forest and you sift leaf litter, you're going to find these. And Jitin was working on these two genera in his home uh, country, uh, this is India, and he was focusing on a biodiversity hotspot. So uh, the Western Ghats, that consists of the Northern Western Ghats and the Southern Western Ghats. And he did the molecular phylogeny for, for this fauna, but we also incorporated uh, this term of this fauna here into global phylogeny for these two genera. And again, we are seeing the same pattern. Once you do a bio, biogeobears analysis, so a biogeographical analysis, you do find that the fauna of India is not monophyletic, which you would expect under continental drift scenario, but is rendered polyphyletic by the inclusion of African taxa, which you see here marked in red. So again, if you do the biogeographical reconstructions, you find that diversification of this lineage here of Leganicophonius and Tyrannicophonius predates the separation of India and Madagascar from South Africa during continental drift. In other words, these lineages are just damn old. Really, really old. But the problem is, morphologically, they all look the same. Wherever you go in the world, a Tyrannicophonius will always look like this. And if you give me a species from South America, and you give me one from Australia, or you give me one from the Mediterranean of Europe, I couldn't tell you where they're coming from. So morphologically, they have not changed at all. One thing that we are doing increasingly is work in biodiversity hotspots. And uh, my master student, Michelle Lawrence, has published a, a wonderful uh, revision of uh, Fialets, so these uh, Hercules pseudoscorpions, which are really basal and very, very rare in Madagascar. Uh, they are quite common in Madagascar, which is very strange, because otherwise, uh, otherwhere in the world, they are really, really rare animals. Again, uh, ooh, what's that? No, oh, that was quite a jump. Okay. What we do see 
is major endemism. Very often species, when she described them, and we use molecules for morph morphological data, very often we have single site endemics. So species where they're only found in one particular site in one particular forest system. So they're not widespread at all. Short range endemic fauna. But the second thing is, even at a generic level, they're highly regionalized. So you, you have one genus in the north of Madagascar, one in the center, and one in the south. But again, that is all really good. What drove Michel Nuts was uh, trying to find morphological character to back up their, the molecular results. Because again, these animals very much look the same. So you can take a pseudoscorpion from the south of Madagascar, you can take one from the north of Madagascar, they look very much the same. And at the generic level also. In the end, we were able to find some sensory CT here on the Kila to at least distinguish the genera, but the species hypothesis are primarily, primarily based on molecular data. And this is one major point I'm trying to get to here. This is a common theme we see in pseudoscorpions because this order probably emerges as the dark taxon of the arachnids. So you might not know what dark taxa are in taxonomy. These are hyperdiverse invertebrate lineages that are poorly studied. There's very poor taxonomic expertise, but very often there's also very high genetic diversity, which is not reflected by morphology. And what we do see now is whenever we touch with the genetics of pseudoscorpions, this fauna explodes in terms of species diversity. Just to give you one example, here is one species from Central Europe, Neobesium carcinoides which is the most common pseudoscorpion species in Central Europe. You'll find it everywhere. When you go out, collect leaf litter, sample leaf litter, you find it in, in numbers. It's been morphologically clearly diagnosed. It's uh, an old species. We know it for a long time. And uh, as part of a German barcode of life project, where basically Germany decided to barcode all invertebrate species in Germany, uh, Christoph Muster focused uh, on the pseudoscorpions and uh, they did a bit of sequencing on the pseudoscorpion fauna, and even in this boring fauna of Germany with only 50 described species, and this very widespread species, we find that this common pseudoscorpion species falls apart. It is a complex of at least seven or eight cryptic species that morphologically might be different, might not be different, we do not know. It's not even monophyletic. So if you go from Germany now, which has 50 described pseudoscorpion species, and you find seven or eight more just in this particular species, and you take that to the tropics, where you have hyperdiverse faunas anyway, what does it tell you about diversity of pseudoscorpions more generally? It's just very diverse. We do see that explosion of diversity everywhere. This is work for, uh, by Dora Halevich. She's from uh, Croatia, and she was in my lab for a year. And as part of her PhD, she focused on cave pseudoscorpions. Um, so the Balkans region of uh, the Mediterranean is a hotspot for caves. Basically, this landscape is a Swiss cheese, and there's lots of cave endemics. And again, she did the sequencing for the pseudoscorpions in these caves. And I um, mean, look at this tree. It's coming up in a second. Kaboom. Yeah? So that's going to keep you busy for the next 20 years. So the two most common families, the Cretoniates and uh, the Neobiziates that live in leaf litter, just explode in terms of diversity. More importantly, species that were morphologically clearly diagnosed fall apart, their species complexes. How do you de delineate that at the species level? This is for you, Shahan, machine learning maybe. So trying to say pseudoscorpions, when we touch the genetics, are probably going to be just as diverse as spiders. So we need to focus on them a bit more. So now I want to leave biogeography and evolution and systematics and uh, move on to the second galaxy, which is ecology. One thing I became interested in some years ago is looking as, at pseudoscorpions in, as predators. Now, pseudoscorpions are predators, just as spiders. Uh, but what kind of predators are they? Are they apex predators in the systems where they live? Are they secondary consumers, basically feeding on herbivores? Or are they somewhere in the middle? Uh, for spiders, this is known. Spiders are generalist predators. For pseudoscorpions, that's not been known. So we used a large collection of pseudoscorpions from Indonesia and a team, uh, my friends from the University of Göttingen, 
and a bachelor student, uh, Dana Liebke here, she uh, used isotope studies, and I don't want to go into the details of this graph because it's a bit complex, but basically we were able to show using isotope studies that pseudoscorpions are in the trophic level two and three uh, levels of a pyramid, uh, energy pyramid. Basically, they feed on herbivores, and they also feed on other carnivores. So basically, they feed on everything that they can subdue. So they're generalist predators, similar to spiders. And they often feed on smaller prey items yeah, that they can envenomate or eat. But from this trend, so basically eating everything that's smaller than you, some pseudoscorpions have evolved more complex behaviors. For example, these guys here have learned to bring down larger prey essentially by uh, hunting like a pack of lions. So uh, here, uh, an ant was unfortunate to get into a colony of these pseudoscorpions. You see them leeching onto the ant, uh, envenomating the insect, and then starting to feed on it. And here I want to highlight some work that Everton Tizo Predoso has done in South America, and he's, a fantastic, he's done a fantastic job with just one species, Paratemnoides nidificator which is a common attempted species under bark in South America and lives in colonies. And Everton was able to show, and these papers are great, so I really like them, that's why I'm showing them here, that in these colonies there is division of labor. So that is, adult uh, pseudoscorpions for, uh, feed their young, they look after their young, they don't discriminate between the young of a sister and a brother or uh, so forth, so they really share, but also, these pseudoscorpions, once, they, uh, once the colony size grows and it reaches a certain size, these animals tend to become phoretic. So there's a trend towards phoresy, hitchhiking on an insect, when there's scarcity of energy, so to say. So how does it work? The colony becomes bigger and bigger, and then there is some kind of a trigger, and some pseudoscorpions in this colony decide to hitchhike on an insect. And it can be any insect, it can be a fly, it can be, it can be a beetle or whatnot. But this is just not where it ends. At some stage during the dispersal process, when the pseudoscorpions actually have attached to the insect, they decide at the same time to go for the kill. So they envenomate this poor insect, and this insect is then used as the first energy uh, source for the newly emerging colony. So how does that work? How do the pseudoscorpions decide what they want to do and when they do it, nobody knows. So it's completely unknown, but it's cool anyway. And Everton was able to show that pseudoscorpions even are on the way to becoming very social, at least in this particular species. He, was, he applied the oil sociality criteria by Wilson, basically showing that pseudoscorpions tick many boxes. So you have females breeding together. They make this uh, breeding chambers, the silken chambers where they breed. There is a, di a division of labor within the colony. There's overlapping generations of pseudoscorpions and there's cooperative foraging. So that is quite a lot and it's really interesting, I find. So think again, pseudoscorpions are not always the solitary hunters that live in leaf litter. They can do a lot more. But again, what are the genetic trajectories towards this? Not known. Another thing what Everton found out that uh, pseudoscorpions can actually also be parasite, um, parasites or cuckoos because in the colonies of Paratemnoides nidificator you sometimes find a cuckoo species, the closely related uh, Paratemnoides melanopigus, which invades the colonies of the host species and the young ones, so the nymphs of this uh, cuckoo species are being fed by nidificator thereby reducing the general fitness of the colony. So pseudoscorpions can also be cuckoos. And once we investigate the social behavior of pseudoscorpions, we will find that more often, I think. That's not the end of it in this species. When you deprive a colony of energy, so basically you stop feeding it, uh, the nymphs start to cannibalize each other, but then, Basically, they want to survive, but then something else happens, and that is something we know from some spider groups, such as the velvet spiders, erasids. The female pseudoscorpions can actually be, or, uh, offer themselves to the young to be fed, so metrophagy. So the females leave the breeding chamber, 
they just lie somewhere still for a while and the juveniles follow leech onto their mom and eating it alive, right? Again, very cool, genetically, ecologically, pretty much unexplored, and they're just for one species. It's just amazing. And there are 4,500 described species, and there are probably tenfold as many species once we do the genetics. So there's lots of room for studies. Pseudoscorpions also have a very complex reproduction, uh, uh, reproductive strategy, in the sense that uh, unlike with the spiders, where the females are deposited somewhere and then, uh, you know, on the ground and then there's some kind of care or not. Pseudoscorpions form a disc of eggs and the, the larvae as they hatch are being fed by the mom. The larvae need to mold twice in order to become the first nymphal stage. Huh? It's playing up again. Ah, oh, here we go. So let's look at that. Look at this. This is a larvae attached to the genital opening of mom with a pharyngeal pump. And during the course of the development, the mother pushes nutritional fluid into the embryos twice so that they can grow and mold. This is highly energy dense. Why do you have this small pseudoscorpion sitting in a chamber? This is all his offspring. She feeds them twice before they're actually released as nymphs. Think about the energy that a female needs to have in order to do this kind of thing. And during this time, they don't eat. Again, how often is a female to do this in her lifetime? Only once, two, three, four times? Nobody knows. Generally, mating behaviors are quite complex. And what I really like about pseudoscorpions is when you take the phylogeny, you can see the progression, the evolution of behavioral and eco ecological traits across the phylogeny really nicely, better than in spiders. Just looking at reproductive strategies. In the most basal families, the heterospironida and etoposphironida, the males, and that is something Peter Weigold has studied in the 60s, and since then there hasn't been any more studies, and all of this is his work, the males seem to deposit or drop spermatophores randomly. They're simple spermatophores, basically a droplet of sperm on a stalk. And when the females, that's the theory, come across these spermatophores rather randomly, they massage these spermatophores and then walk over them, and the sperm is released into the genitalia. That is the theory from the 60s. There's probably some pheromones involved, but we don't know. There's no body contact. Uh, there is no complex mating behavior here. But once we move into the Eochirata and we look in, in the, into some basal lineages of the Eochirata, we do find that it's becoming more complex. Here's the Serianus in the Neobis Uidia, And here's different. The males in this particular species can also produce silk for the production of uh, sperm wraps. But they don't use the galia to do that. Then they have a rectal pore to produce silk. This is also, again, very different. And then produce the silk in chambers. But they only do that in the presence of females. And then the female kind of finds its way towards the spermatophore and picks the spermatophore up. Again, there is no body contact here. But the male and the female somehow already start interacting. And once we go to the crown group pseudoscorpions, we do find these. This is for tomorrow when I come from the party. Actually, tonight. So, Califeroidea, complex mating dances. Males and females interact. They need to synchronize behavior. They dance for half an hour or even longer. The males have these complex organs, the ram's organs, that they pull out. They are massive, right? And they pull them out fast. And the spermatophores are highly complex. So there's really interesting behavior, direct body contact. And increasingly, these systems are being studied. Here's work by Gabriel Kirchmeier. He was a PhD student at the University of Vienna, basically exploring Dactylocalifer, one species, uh, and the mating dances. So here's a simple ephogram of uh, mating dances. There's initial body contact. Then there's a mating dance, which is highly complex. 
and I don't want to go into the details of that, but finally the male deposits the spermatophore and drags the female over it, but he simply doesn't drag her over it. He also has a modified tarsus of the first leg that is so that he can hold the, the spermatophore in this uh, groove here while he pushes the female over the spermatophore and even more so the tarsi of his first leg are uh, shaped so that he can open the female genital opening during that process. So assisting her in uh, taking up that sperm. So you see, it's complex there. Ah, yeah. Now, two days ago, we heard a fantastic talk by Bruno Bosato on sexual selection and sexual conflict, uh, also sexual dimorphism. That's also been recorded for pseudoscorpions. And this is work by Jen, Jen Zay and David Zay from the US. Uh, there's one particular species, Semiocernis armiger, which is sporadic on pentoftalmid flies, also here in South America. So what are pentoftalmid flies? I think the colloquial name is elephant flies. The larvae of these flies live in tree bark and they are basically created with boreholes. And then the flies emerge from these boreholes, they're made, and then they try to find a new tree to lay their eggs. This particular pseudoscorpion species is sporadic just on this fly species. And the males have two morphs. There's a fighter male, which you can see has this massive paddy palps. And there's this, how would you call that? A sneaker male, Bruno? So males with uh, like smaller paddy palps. And these are the females. Importantly, the males, these fighter males, monopolize the boreholes to mate the females, female pseudoscorpions, because the female pseudoscorpions have a great interest to get to these boreholes because they wait for the flies to hatch and emerge from the boreholes. So they do fight, and these males probably have some other mating tactic. Um, what's more, this pseudoscorpion can decide what the sex of the fly is, the pseudoscorpions will prefer hitchhiking on a female fly because only female flies lay eggs and they go to another tree. So how they do that, how they decide what is a male and a female fly is not known. But also then the males tend to monopolize the boreholes where female flies emerge because they have an interest to mate. So it seems highly complex, porosy, it's not a simple trait. It's not simply getting from A to B. It can be a sexually selected trait, or it can at least be involved in sexual selection. Generally, for Z, this is kind of a trait that we usually associate with pseudoscorpions, right? So as a textbook example, pseudoscorpions are always sporadic, no? No, no, they're not. If we look at the most basic pseudoscorpion lineages here, the Ketonuridia and the Phyaluridia, they are never sporadic. They live in leaf litter. They have a typical uh, leaf litter fauna, range restricted, dispersal, not dispersal prone at all, don't do too much. Uh, but also, when we look at the pseudoscorpions with venom glands, not all of these lineages are phoretic. No, no, not at all. It's only the crown group here. These pseudoscorpions that tend to live in ephemeral habitats, so habitats that change over time, tend to be phoretic. Just to give you an example, again going to Europe, this is Lamprocernis nodosus, one of the very common pseudoscorpion species in Europe. That is a specialist pseudoscorpion that likes uh, dung, cow dung. So cow dung is fantastic because it attracts flies and the flies lay larvae there and that's good food for pseudoscorpions. So what the pseudoscorpions do, they hitchhike from dung hive to, uh, to uh, sorry, from dung to dung patch, uh, basically feeding on the, uh, the fly larvae. And once the new flies emerge and the dung patch dries up, they become highly phoretic. You can find them in the hundred on these uh, dung patches. I need a bit more then. And, um, and then disperse to the next uh, dung patch. So ephemeral habitats. So the last five minutes of my talk, focusing a bit on applied research. So where's this research gonna go and how applied can it be? And there is new research that is coming from Kilifer Cancroides uh, that you can find under tree bark, uh, but you can also find it in beehives. Um, and that's uh, quite easy to breed in captivity. Uh, and this animal is being used for venomic research these days. Uh, until maybe five or six years ago, we didn't know anything about uh, pseudoscorpion venoms at all. We didn't know what they are, 
and how they function. But some years ago, and two years ago, Jonas Kramer from Cologne, his PhD student, developed a protocol, and I don't know how he did it, to actually mill pseudoscorpions, and they're tiny, using capillary systems here, and a bit of like uh, voltage. And he manages to get five nanoliters of venom out of these pseudoscorpions. Uh, it's, I've seen him doing it. I would never be that patient, but he managed to do it. Importantly, also here, he discovered some interesting morphological structure, structures because on the venom tooth, there's a small lamina that needs to be retracted for venom release. So that gives us a clue why pseudoscorpions can decide to be only phoretic or why they can decide to be phoretic and go for the kill because they have a structure that helps them the venom release. But importantly, we have data now on venoms, uh, both from the transcriptome, so basically the genes that code for enzymes and proteins that are being sequenced from the tissue of the venom glands. That's on the left-hand side, and I don't want to go into all these details because I'm not so good in biochemistry, but you do see that it's very, very complex. There are lots of components, and there are different components from spider and scorpion venoms, really quite different. They also looked at the proteomes, so basically the proteins and the enzymes that are in the venom itself. And recently, only in the last week, there's been a paper investigating the biomedical properties of this venom. And there is a lot to it. It's antimicrobial, it's antibacterial, it uh, really is very effective in killing insects because it works on the sodium channels of insect muscles. So we will see a lot more about pseudoscorpion venoms now that this is tackled in the future. But there's also practical research. This pseudoscorpion species, the same one, Kilifer cancorius, that you can find uh, under bark, is also common in beehives. And it feeds on uh, varora, varora mites, which you might know, because these are the mites that are causing major problems to beekeepers at the moment. Uh, these uh, mites are being carried by infested bees from one hive to the other, and they suck on the larvae of the bees, and the, uh, the bees that, uh, that are, well, treated like this, um, can't fly, so these are being screwed. So, Califer cancroides is known now to be uh, very effective in controlling the mites because it really likes to eat them. You can, see, you can see at the base. One pseudoscorpion can eat up to 10 mites a day. Yeah, a day. And it's very effective in killing them. And not only does it eat varroa mites, it can also eat other pest species such as tracheal mites and hive beetle larvae. So at the moment, there's lots of practical research going uh, in, into this species from the bee community, uh, specifically in Europe, because we want to get away from treating beehives with chemicals, because then you, the, you know, the, the honey you can't sell, or you can sell, but it's not biological honey, so to speak. So at the moment, there's a lot of research into uh, practical research into trying to make pseudoscorpion friendly beehives that you make so that they become really attractive for pseudoscorpions. So once they start getting into these beehives, they also stay in them. Even more so, you can now buy stocks of Kelifer cancroides in Germany as a beekeeper, as a natural stock to put into your beehives so that you can start biological control of uh, your varomites. And they seem to make good money because a stock of 10 animals is quite expensive. I think it's 70 euros. I don't know how much that is in, uh, in other currencies, but it's a lot. Um, I've been out some years ago looking uh, at this beehive here, and the beekeeper there was able to really make a beehive that is super friendly for pseudoscorpions. Basically, he, he has another drawer in the base, and he basically just imitates the natural habitats of these pseudoscorpions which is tree bark, and it puts a bit of straw in there. And what we do see in this video, and there's sound to it, it he's from Ukraine, so it's Ukrainian. Anyway, you see these two scorpions crawling around. They're breeding here, they're nesting here. There are many of them, many. And they're all over the beehive doing their thing. But they can try to, or they can get away from the bees when they want to, for example, to reproduce. And this beekeeper has no problems with varroa mites whatsoever. So he's figured it out. It's easy to do. Finally, in the last slides, personally, I've been very interested in trying to use pseudoscorpions as uh, biodiversity indicators. 
So pseudoscorbins are mesopredators. They're never really common in their ecosystems, but they are everywhere. But what do they do? So some years ago, uh, we did um, a study of pseudoscorpions in Indonesian rainforests uh, that are being uh, destroyed at the moment for rubber plantations and oil palm plantations. So we sampled pseudoscorpions in rainforests, where they're quite diverse, but also in these transitional uh, plantations of rubber and oil palm. We did two ecological gills, litter pseudoscorpions and soil pseudoscorpions, and we did find what you would expect. Diversity is highest in rainforest systems, but what we also found, and that's the next graph, is that oil palm plantations, for example, did not have any pseudoscorpions whatsoever, right? And rubber plantations had very few. In other words, pseudoscorpions are probably very good biodiversity indicator. A rainforest or forest that has many pseudoscorpion species is probably very healthy forest. So this is something I want to do in the future, also look a bit more into the practical aspects of what they can tell us about nature and habitat conservation. Just the last slide. So wrapping up these uh, galaxies, so to say, I'm bringing them together into one, and just basically I said, pseudoscorpions are the least known arachnid order. Some years ago, Christian Bergner, who some of you would know, he's a, an arachnid morphologist, a really brilliant man, and a student of his and uh, I, we looked together into musculatory anatomy of a pseudoscorpion leg coxa, because we were trying to figure out how pseudoscorpions walk. Easy peasy, we thought it's a good thesis for a bachelor student because it's not super complicated. You micro CT an animal and then you reconstruct the muscles and there you go. Think again, this is the coxa for three families. There are more than 30 muscles just in the coxa and we don't know what they do. To be honest, I don't know how pseudoscorpions walk. What do they need all the muscles for? I have no idea. And since the 1920s and 1930s, nobody's ever looked at internal anatomy of pseudoscorpions at all. It's all old morphology, German morphology from the 1920s, hardcore and French. So we need to do something there. So just to say, there's so much room to explore. Just go and do it. And then bringing us back to, yeah, our galaxy. So we've learned something about systematics and biogeography, and we will see many more family uh, phylogenies in the future. We will also see a lot more barcoding studies in the future. We will also see a revised taxonomic concepts of pseudoscorpions in the future, because the, the idea of basically drawing everything and still not knowing what your species is, because you're basically drawing the same morphological characters all over that are not variable, it's not really helpful. So we have to think about a new concept, how to describe these species and describe them fast. There are so many. But also looking at ecology, just pick one species here in the neotropic that does something interesting and go and do it. If you do it well, you have your nature papers. Don't know for you. We need to work towards our first nature paper. And the third thing is applied research. If you need a justification for your research, do something very practical or do something that is complicated if you're interested in biomedical research. Just saying silk. Nobody knows anything about pseudoscorpion silk. Nothing. So just go and do it. All right? And with that, I will release you from my talk. It was a pleasure to, uh, to be here. Um, and now I'm waiting for going out dancing tonight and take some questions in the meantime. Thank you. Well, thank you, Danilo, for your amazing talk. Uh, there's uh, room for one question. Okay, so. Thank you. Um, it's possible that uh, the scorpions throughout forests can be transported throughout large biogeographical barriers. And if so, could they adapt to the new environment? There are some studies on this, on one of the model species in the Isthmus of Panama, and they can be transported for longer distances, but it does depend on the, the host, so the vector. So if that's an insect, how far can the insect fly? Or how far can the mammal run? Or how far does the bird fly? So it is possible. 
how they can adapt to new environments then, uh, that is also not known. Uh, thank you, Anilo. We have uh, another uh, question. Uh, I'm going to read the virtual one and then Ricardo can talk. So um, this talk was amazing. Thank you. I have a question. In a species where there is no morphological differences, have you observed any behavioral differentiation or differences on their spermatophoric morphology? No, nobody's looking at spermatophores that much. Uh, the morphologies are always highly conserved and uh, at least the external anatomy and morphology is highly conserved. I do not know if the spermatophores differ between, uh, or the female genitalia differ between closely related species. That is also something that needs to be done. Thank you. The last one for Ricardo. Thank you, Danilo, for this passionate speech. Uh, you showed us that there are three different uh, reproductive strategies mm. on pseudoscorpion, the uh, spermatoph leave alone, the spermatoph with silk to help female to find it, and also the pseudoscorpions that dance. I would like to understand this in an uh, evolutive uh, way. I don't know if they are monophyletic, arise several times, and so on. Yeah. That's what I said before. There's such a nice progression in the pseudoscorpion tree of life from the most basal lineages that just drop spermatophores randomly and they have simple spermatophores, but there's never any body contact. There's no mating dances. There's no interaction of the sexes towards, uh, like uh, in the middle of a pseudoscorpion tree where the males start interacting with females, but not in direct body contact but they also then start uh, depositing spermatophores only if they're triggered by females towards then sophisticated mating dances, which are uh, variable across the higher group of the Eochirata. So the Kiliferoidea or Temnitz or so forth, they, they have these very complex strategies. So it would be really interesting to look into this crown group if in the mating dance strategy, uh, if there is a change in the progression of evolutionary trajectories. Uh, but also that hasn't been done. Yeah. Well, we're, we don't have more time. So thank you, Danilo, and uh, with help of our committee. This oh, is thank you so much. You're you. kind to me. So thank you, everybody. Eh, bueno, vamos a, a nuestro receso y nos vemos en la sala hasta las 9.15. Muchas gracias.